started. So let me start off by introducing our panel. First up, we have Amy Chang. She is the CEO of Delta Nutrition Nutricentials. Nutricentials. Previously, she was VP of Strategy and Investor Relations for AMS Healthcare. And during which time, AHS his market cap grew from 220 million to over 1 billion. So she has some great stuff to talk about um, with her experience being both on the side of angel investor, entrepreneurial, and then also with the corporate background. Um, Dean Rosenberg, here in the middle, serial entrepreneur turned angel investor. He started a number of companies in San Diego. Some were self-funded, one raised 32 million in venture capital. And his most recent venture raised two million in funding from Tech Coast Angels and was recently acquired by a public company. Um, he's currently on the board of Tech Coast Angels and he loves helping other entrepreneurs raise funding and grow their businesses. And he also does a lot of mentorship in the community as well. And next up, we have Andy White. He is currently the startup advocate with the Downtown San Diego Partnership. And his goal in that role is to create an environment to foster the growth of startups in downtown San Diego. And prior to this, he was one of the founding partners of the Vegas Tech Fund, part of the downtown project. So thank you all for being here very much. All right, so let's get started. So um, can each of you talk a little bit about your firm and, and your role there, and what sectors that you focus on, and the size of the first investment that you typically will do? Well, I am the pseudo investor of the group. Um, I have experience in angel investing and as a venture capitalist and running a, an accelerator program. Um, we are currently working on a new fund um, methodology that would start at the very early stage, um, but that is not currently available, so I don't want to put any false hope out there. It's not a new source yet. Um, but uh, the, the main focus of, of this is looking at new funding methodologies. Uh, we've been doing the traditional venture capital route for uh, about 60 years now, and it's had success, uh, but it's not the right fit for all different types of companies, and we think there's a better way. So I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. So uh, again, I'm Dean from, um, I guess I'm here representing Techos Angels, and how many people um, know what an angel investor is? We've used the term a bunch, but a lot of okay. So for those who didn't raise their hand, um, there's venture capitalists who typically take other people's money, they start a fund, they charge a fee, and then they invest it professionally into uh, uh, companies, a lot of times startup companies with the hope of a return. There's um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, friends and family, or what are known as the three Fs, friends, family, and fools, who are typically, um, they know the entrepreneur, they'll invest no matter how wacky the deal and no matter what the business plan says. And that's typically how you can get your sort of, you know, first, you know, ten thousand to hundred thousand dollars. And then to fill that gap in the middle are angel investors, and and they're typically called angel investors because if you look at a continuum from sort of venture capital to philanthropy, most angel investors are somewhere in the middle of that. So some, I, I know some uh, members in Techos Angels that don't care if they ever get a return on their investment; they just want to help early stage companies. And then there are people like me who. I'm very passionate about helping the San Diego startup ecosystem by creating jobs in this, in, in this community, by doing big things, but I also expect to get a return on my investment. Uh, and so Tech Coast Angels, one way of getting to your question, um, is a, um, one of the largest angel investment networks in the country. Um, we have in the San Diego chapter, there are five chapters in Southern California, we have in San Diego we have just over 100 members. Uh, we invest in San Diego five to six million dollars a year. Chapter-wide, we invest 15 to 16 million dollars a year. And um, if you added in the money we raise through syndication and through follow-on rounds, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. So, um, and it's typically people who've either, either been entrepreneurs before, they've come out of um, the corporate world. Um, Amy, like I, has been on both sides of the uh, both sides of the table, um, both as an entrepreneur and as an, an angel investor. And um, so I'm here today just to share a little bit of the TCA story, and um, I'm personally involved in about 10 companies. I sit on a number of boards, and I, um, as Remy said, I, I do a little bit of as well. So I have sat on both sides, or am sitting on both sides. I can tell you the angel side's more fun. <laughs> but the entrepreneurial side, I probably will learn a heck of a lot more. Um, 
Although on the angel side, I've definitely learned quite a bit as well. I haven't been an angel investor for that long, probably about 18 months. Um, but I, I realized that you know, if you're going to be an angel investor, the best way to do it is to create um, your own portfolio um, of companies that you invest in because you need to have diversification um, and then to be very careful about you know, what you invest in. And so it's, it's a lot of fun because um, you feel like you're getting to know some amazing founders. You're getting to see all of the very cool things that they're inventing and building. You're getting to know them as people. And then you're investing in what they're doing, but you're also investing in them as people. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you get to know them, and uh, they might ask you for some help. They might ask you to have coffee and, and get mentorship. And I think that that's a fantastic way of getting to know a person. Um, I definitely would like to get returns on my investments, and so um, you know, that's why I'm always there to, to help however I can. But it's it's been fantastic. <coughs> Yeah, so, um, so a typical angel investor, and of course there's many different types, a billionaire, Silicon Valley guy might make a much larger investment, but a typical, in, in the San Diego community, a typical angel investor is investing somewhere between $25,000 and $250,000 in a company. Um, in Tech Coast Angels, most of our members will typically invest between twenty-five dollars and $50,000, but the benefit of the angel group is if you put 20 of those together, you now have a million dollar funding event. And when I was on the other side of the table, um, I co-founded a company where we raised $2 million in two separate rounds. So a million dollars in each of two separate rounds, led by Tech Coast Angels. They put in about $600,000 in each round, and then our Rolodex put in the other $400,000. But because they were leading the deal and they had that infrastructure, we were able to go out to others and complete that. So I like to say with Tech Coast Angels, we want to be um, the best place for the best entrepreneurs and best companies to raise up to a million dollars. Um, our sweet spot seems to be in that sort of 400000 to a $1 million kind of range, but we'll also support the company as it grows and um, we have good relationships for the follow-on funding and such as well. Still waiting. Uh, yeah, I my my portfolio at one time was about 110 investments. That's through the accelerator program, the tech fund, and, and my personal angel investments. Uh, I've been doing that for about six years, and I have not I have yet to have an exit. Uh, I still have probably 60 of those 100 plus teams that are still in play. So it's not. Um, like I, I, I've done a poor job or have given up. Uh, if you had asked me three years ago who are my top ten teams, it would have been a very different list, uh, several of which do not exist anymore because that's kind of the nature part of VC is that there's a, a propensity for uh, flameouts where someone goes a little too big and can't raise that next round. Uh, I've certainly seen several of those happen. Uh, my current list, I'm still very excited about. I think I've got a, a, a really good set of 10. Uh, and the way that you, you really vote on those is with that follow-on round. And, and so there are several where I've put more money in to keep my share of the company. And that allows me to then have the more favorable outcome as the team grows and, and there is an opportunity for an exit. But the typical exit, it's taking about 13 years now, average, for, for a company. Don't that's, say that. that's a long time. That's a long time. Um, not that it doesn't happen in shorter, and of course those are the ones that get the press, uh, especially the shorter amount of time for the bigger dollars, but the average is 13 years. So I still have hope, which is the good part of it, um, but it's, it's going to take some time. I, all of mine are still in play, so I'm still all very happy about them. I have one problem child, but I feel like that home child can get over the hump, so I'm still I'm optimistic, uh, but, but it, it does take a while, and so, so I'm patiently waiting, but still very happy. Okay. My, my favorite investment, and I'm probably in 12 companies, and uh, my favorite one is a company that has cured blindness unambiguously in mice. 
for two very rare diseases, retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration. These are devastating diseases that strike typically young and there was no cure. And um, they're now, um, since the funding, they're now in clinical trials, um, so they're actually dosing patients. And um, this is the kind of investment that is an angel investor's dream because not only is there the potential for a financial return, but there is the potential for a social return. And there are a number of people at Tech Coast Angels that only invest in what they call impact investing or social investing, where um, there's um, you know, a positive kind of um, community benefit in addition to the, addition to the financial benefit. I'm sorry. Yeah, can I please speak up? <laughs> and I was the loud one. I know. <laughs> number one is integrity. I mean, if, if there's any reason to believe that this person wouldn't be trustworthy, um, I think that people will run away. Uh, and, and so I, for me, it's, like I understand sometimes founders make mistakes or they just, from lack of experience, might make a mistake or two, and, and that's totally fine. We all learn from them, but I, to me, if, if you don't have integrity, I mean, that, that's just, like, no one can help you. So I, I look at it, I mean, integrity is obviously a big one. I, I look at, can you hear me now? All right. I'm not, that's the sprint guy who used to be the Verizon guy, for those of you who watch TV. Um, so, uh, um, so I look for um, serious optimism tempered by unwavering humility and realism. Uh, and, and, that's, and, and you have to have both optimism and realism because Nothing takes down a company faster than rose-colored glasses disease, where you're absolutely sure you're going to do it. You're mortgaging the house. You're quitting the job. You're, you know, not buying, you know, kids food or dog food or whatever. And then and the reality is your, your idea sucks. There's no chance it's going to be successful. But the, the rose-colored glasses um, um, made that not not evident. So that's why you need the optimism because. Um, in fact, I always used to say, I made a better, I'm a computer science guy by sort of education, I made a better CTO than CEO because I always said um, a good CEO isn't burdened by the realities of implementation. They just tell other people to do it and make it happen. And I was always like the engineer who was like, this isn't going to work, here's why. And so I probably was a little low on the optimism side, but much higher on the realism side. And that worked in some deals and didn't work in other deals. But that, that combination um, is important. And in general, investors, you've probably all heard this before, investors typically invest in the jockey, not the horse. Um, the person that they're investing in is most important because I don't know what the statistics are, maybe somebody else has the statistics, but more than 50% of ventures will pivot during their lifetime, which means what you end up doing is not what was in the business plan that the investor invested in. If you're investing in the right team, they'll navigate through that pivot. If you're investing in the product, the product dies. So, uh, so that's important to, uh, to pick the right person. All good points, uh, but in addition to that, uh, I look for someone who's coachable and a good learner, uh, and based on the other things that we talked about, uh, that's integrity also comes into play with themselves. So in order to be a good learner, you have to be honest with yourself. That's referring to the rose-colored glasses and your, your market size and your opportunity and, and all of those things. Um, if an entrepreneur is not able to be honest with themselves, then it's going to cause a lot of problems with the team and uh, tends to get you in a situation where they've already fallen in love with their product and that's not a way to make really good decisions based on your customer needs or your marketplace. So it's something you want to constantly be evaluating and make sure you're staying abreast of that. Uh, as soon as you think you know your customer, you're on your way to losing, typically. It's, it makes it very difficult. Things are changing so rapidly. And Andy's comment about coachability is particularly important with angel investors because part of the return on their investment is the feeling that they're contributing to something. And so angel investors are usually less likely to invest in jerks. Um, now, the bummer about that is if you look at some of the most successful companies in the world, 
<coughs> Facebook, Zuckerberg, Gates, Microsoft, Larry Ellis and Oracle. If you follow the early days, they're all brilliant philanthropists now, but if you follow the early days, they were all jerks. So we angel investors are always going to miss the big deals because we don't typically invest in jerks. Uh, <laughs> So I like that too, but what really works is, and I've said this in some other audiences, is you have to be inspiring. Because every time somebody buys something, whether it's choosing to invest in a company or whether it's buying a car or whether it's buying a shirt, it's an emotional buying decision, it's an emotional decision. And so you have to inspire the investor. And, and so I want to be inspired. I want them to, and I can talk about no, your, that's true, if I talk about yeah. your deal a little okay. bit, a Amy, okay. Amy started a company and she told me what it was and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, not really my thing, but kind of interesting. No, the founder did. And then, yeah, and then, and then she like peeled back the onion and says, oh, but we did a clinical trial and it worked, and oh, we already have the product, and oh, we have this world-class advisors and we're taking it to China with a guy from Procter & Gamble, and it's like, wow, it's like she totally like got me emotionally attached to her deal. And so, you know, not everybody has all of those things, but the, the more you can do to be inspiring while being optimistic, while being humble, while being coachable, and all these other things, you can't lose. Well, no, that's true, because if you're not inspiring to the investor, they don't think that you'll be inspiring to the customer or anybody else on the team, so I agree with that. Uh, the rote answer for this, for me is how big is your customer's problem that you're wanting to solve? Why is it worth solving? Why are you the one to do it and why now? And if you can understand all of that and go into more information based on experiments that you've run and how you know those things to be true and you've proven pieces of it, then that's where I like to start the conversation. Uh, all of the other pieces are very important as well. Um, but it's always a red flag for me when someone comes in initially talking about the really cool shiny object that they've built and all they need is some investment dollars so they can go find customers. And that's, that's pretty backwards. Alright, very good. Um, how much <coughs> revenue or traction would you like to see in a company before they come and talk to you? Yeah. So, so before I answer that, I'm going to kind of tag on to the last question. So what everybody who wants to raise money from outside investors needs to understand is they are looking for a significant return on their investment when they're talking to you. And it's not because they're greedy. Well, they are greedy, but it's not because they're greedy. It's because a typical angel investment portfolio, let's say there's 10 com companies in an investment portfolio, we expect five of them are going to go to zero. That's just the history, that's just the numbers. I know that 10 of, out, of, out of 10 investments in my portfolio, five of them are going to zero. About three of them will return some capital. Might be half times what I put into it, might be five times, what, what have you. And my expectation is if I picked right, two of them are going to be home runs. And it's those home runs that essentially pay for all the losers. So that's why when you're presenting to venture capital, you're presenting to angel investors, you're always here, you need to show a billion dollar market or you need to show a sufficiently large market that the angel investor could be inspired that this can be a home run. Because if I'm only going to invest in companies that are even telling me from the beginning it's not a large market, I'll never get those two that are going to pay for the five that I know are going to go to zero. So, you know, part of pitching investors for funding is having the empathy to put yourself in their shoes and know what their fears are, what their concerns are. And one of them is, am I looking at a company that can be a home run? And that causes some crazy stuff because then it means every deal we look at shows a billion dollar exit, which we know isn't going to happen. Every deal we look at shows the famous hockey stick where, you know, I, 
you know, you're doing $20 million a year in, in year two. Well, how much are you doing now? Well, none, but right after funding, we're going to be doing $5 million. Oh, have you ever built a company to $5 million in two months after you received $100,000? No? Okay, well, you know, so, so there's this, like, again, this tempering of, like, reality and humility, and, and it's, a, it's a tricky one because you have to inspire the investor that they can get there without just completely doing a mechanical BS exercise that we're tired of looking at over and over. Oh, there's the hockey stick, there's the billion dollars, okay, whatever. Now tell me the real story. I think there's there's three kinds of um, founders. There's, from an execution perspective, there's the one who has not generated a single dollar yet. Great idea, they're shiny people, but like have never made a dollar. And then there's the people who are generating revenues, they figured out how to make a dollar, but they get to this like revenue stall point and they can't seem to take it to the next level. And so it's sort of stagnant. And then there's people who have actually you know, made a dollar and then made many, many, many more dollars. And so I, I sort of feel like people drop into one of these you know, three buckets and I, I hope y'all are here. Um, the ones that just cannot seem to make a dollar, it's really hard to watch, especially if you're an investor. Um, the, the ones in the middle, you have hope, right? But, but, um, but really, these are the ones that are probably your, your best bet. Usually, it's somebody who's done it before, and that's what gives you the confidence that they can do it again. But, but there are, we're always reminded, like, you know, there are lots of, some of the biggest exits in the world, some of the biggest IPOs are companies that had no revenue, right? right? And, you know, Twitter, Snapchat, mm -hmm. Facebook, Google, exactly. you can go on and on. They didn't have a revenue model for, you know, half a decade. Um, no, but at least so, they have, like, 4 million page views in a month or right, something, they, right? So, yeah. so that gives you a little bit more confidence. Right, so that's what that traction program is in, right? Because if they don't have the revenue generation, and, and Andy, you and I had, I mean, um, Dean, you and I had a, a conversation recently about that, that the bar is set kind of high here in San Diego with the startups yeah. that you've seen, right? Yeah, your yeah, experience. Yeah. So and, and can you give people just like a little bit of a, like what's the landscape so, or where they should be? So, and I don't remember who said this, somebody smarter than me said this, um, but they, they said if an idea is worth 10 and a prototype is worth 100, then a customer is worth 10000 And so it doesn't mean you can't get funded with an idea. It doesn't mean you can't get funded with a prototype. But the closer you can come to demonstrating that there is an arm's length customer who's willing to write a check or give you a credit card, that de-risks the investment, right? Because now we know you have a product because you couldn't have sold it if you didn't have a product. You know, we know you have a customer, so there's evidence that the market's willing to buy this. It might be a data point of 1 or 5 or 10, but there's evidence. So, you know, for everybody has different profiles. My personal investing style is... I'm willing to sacrifice the upside to protect the downside. So I typically like to see companies that are a little bit further along and have that product um, that they've at least started to introduce to the market. Uh, but then there are others that are seed investors that will throw $10,000 or $50,000 at anything and, and try to help and grow it. And, and, sorry. Which question we're on? <laughs> About traction and revenue, like what would you like to? So for traction, it's it's kind of a an amorphous term that you you use. It, it seems to be a, a, a defensive shield for an, uh, a venture capitalist that they can use in any situation to deflect an entrepreneur, uh, because it's my definition of it, right? So. Uh, I don't like any of your ideas for any of you who just raised your hands that you have companies because you don't have enough traction. Pretty easy to say, but what does that mean? Um, the way I look at it is it's the key performance indicator that you have for your company, which means it has to be real. It can't be a, a vanity metric, a real metric that you are increasing in the shortest amount of time possible. Now, if that key performance indicator is revenue, then that's 10,000 times better than any of the others that you could use. Not that the others are impossible, but what is it that you're doing that you're getting better and better at each day that shows positive growth in your company? And that's what can help tell the story and help people get excited about what you're doing. And if all of your indicators are flatlined, but you really still believe in what you're doing, then that's a very difficult story to tell. So what is that data point? That's where the experimentation comes in. That's where the learning comes in. We are doing these things, we are constantly improving at this rate, and then the smaller that rate, the better off. Um, I think it was Slack just a couple of months ago, they were starting to measure their active user in milliseconds. Like, okay, that's some pretty impressive traction. 
can you measure anything in your company in milliseconds yet? Probably not. But they had gotten to active users, which is typically uh, you know per hour or per day or something, or even per month. <laughs> and they're looking at per millisecond. That's pretty amazing. So that's, that's at the extreme end, but that's exactly the point. That is something that tells a very good story. You start scaling that up on the graph and it's impressive. So what is that for you? And those things could change throughout the history of the company. Eventually you want to get to revenue. That's usually an important one. Um, but just showing that performance, that's, that's where the traction comes in. And it will be different for different people and the bar is being raised uh, every single day. At one point in time, if you had 10,000 downloads on the App Store, that would have been amazing. Today, that's, you're just getting started, and no one would even trust half the numbers if it came out that early, unless you've got Pokemon in your name, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so you touched on it a little bit earlier about your investments, and some of them are going to fail. That's just a reality, right? Um, can you, I know I mean you're, you said you're just starting out, but um, with, with you guys having been doing this for a while, have, have you, what was your biggest learning lesson from one of your ones that have not made it or did not make it? Like, what, why did they fail and what was your learning lesson from it and would you reinvest in them again or what would you do differently? So can I put my entrepreneur hat on and sure. my investor hat on? So yeah, I'll, absolutely. I'll tell, my, story. Yeah. I'll tell my story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, so I, I started, um, my wife and I started the world's first online restaurant ordering site on the internet. Pretty cool. Think open table and stuff. We started in 1996. Okay. For those of you who know your web history, the web as we know it was invented in 1994. Um, this was a story of, and we self-funded it, okay, which meant we're spending our own money and our own retirement. This was an example of where really bad timing meets really bad execution. And, uh, and, and, and so at the end of the day, we didn't have the money to do the sales and marketing that we needed. We grew to a couple hundred restaurants in San Diego, a couple hundred in LA. We fizzled, we sold the assets, and it was not a success. So that was the too small, right? Self-funded, didn't have money to execute. The next um, major venture I did, we raised, Remy mentioned it at the intro, we raised um, over $30 million in venture capital. And when you raise $30 million in venture capital, you do really stupid things. And, um, and, and, and not so much stupid things, like we didn't throw parties, we didn't squander the money, but we moved into a facility that was matched our business plan, because we had rose-colored glasses in those days. Um, when we probably didn't need to, we hired a rock star CEO who turned out couldn't carry a tune, which was a mistake. Um, so, so that was probably too much. My latest company, uh, we raised, as I mentioned before, $2 million in angel investment. It was enough money to actually allow us to take the product we already had and you know, launch some sales and marketing initiatives and introduce it to a global market, but not so much money that we didn't have to still run the business like a business. And at the end of the day, those are just three data points, but it was the just right sort of Goldilocks story that actually allowed us to achieve a meaningful exit to get a positive um, return for our shareholders, to get employee stock options to have value, and to have the founders rewarded for the risks that they took. So, you know, there's there's sort of a balance there. Others will tell other stories about how they needed $100 million in outside capital. I mean, I look at Uber and some of these amazing stories, but amazing how much money they put into those companies. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Of money. Yeah, I think the biggest lesson learned is just that venture capital is not the right funding mechanism for a majority of business. Um, it's the majority of business that do exist. It's not just business that never has existed. Like, I had an idea and I couldn't raise for it. But if you look at who's employing people, even within our community, there are a lot of really big companies that have never raised from a venture capitalist. And we don't have a really good infrastructure for those types of companies. Um, they usually make it through cash flow and hit some inflection point where they can self-fund. Uh, so it's not necessarily the, the easiest route. But this is not the only option, and I think there will be become, uh, becoming more and more options to fund a company that can still be a good-sized company that can grow and add value to the ecosystem and make the founders very wealthy and employ people. Um, that's not venture-backed. But the, the, the main thing to, to remember on this is as soon as you accept that check, even from an angel investor, from an accelerator, accelerator program typically, um, or for a VC, you are agreeing to grow the company to the point where you can have an exit. Because if you don't do that, the investors get nothing out of what you're doing. And that's a really big decision that we're making really early in our life cycle of our companies. 
And it also causes us another reason for some really bad decisions. Uh, and that's, that's the ones where my top 10 list from three years ago had some founders that went for it big in a very short amount of time and were not able to get another swing at the plate when things didn't work out. Um, and that's a tough one. You got a great team, even a, a good idea that's being well executed, but then try, you know, kind of bets the farm on an initiative and doesn't have enough uh, resources to pull their way out of it. That, those are the, the, the toughest ones for me. And we're talking a lot about taking an outside money in this session, but there's nothing wrong with actually starting and growing a lifestyle business where you fund it on your credit cards, you get a bank loan, you take out a second mortgage. What do you do? Whatever you need to bootstrap a company, and you have a really good living that where you make a really nice income, you enjoy what you're doing, you put your kids through school, you do. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, raising money sucks. Like you, you do that, you do that because you have to, not because you want to. Right. Very, very tight. That if you're putting your time and effort into raising money, then you're running the business. And if you don't like hearing no, don't even start. <laughs> right. where, and that's the worst part about what I do is I say no to 95 out of 100 people I talk to. And I have to do it in a way that you know preserves my reputation, preserves the reputation of the organization I'm representing. And that's not easy because nobody likes to hear no. You don't understand. My deal's better than those others. No, actually, it might not be. Or maybe I just don't get it. Or maybe there's another reason. Maybe I just I don't invest in life science, or or I already made my investments for the year. There's all sorts of reasons why you might turn down. So speaking of other types of funding, can you guys share um, any creative ideas uh, to bring in a strategic capital or non-dilutive type of financing for startups? Well, I think yes. I mean, I, in, right? I, yeah. So. So, um, so there's a couple of obvious ones. Um, one is the federal government actually has um, a program called SBIR, or Small Business Innovative Research. It typically funds about seventy to one hundred thousand dollars in a first round, followed by three to hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in a follow-up round. And there's pretty broad categories of what they'll fund. So, depending on what you're doing, you know, if you're opening a chain of dry cleaners, you're probably not going to get SBIR money to do that. But if, you're, if you have a technology that could apply to the, one of the branches of the federal government, that's one way to do non-dilutive. Academic grants is another way. Um, Kickstarter, arguably, is non-dilutive funding. And Kickstarter is getting very, very um, sophisticated. There are consulting companies that you could actually hire to help you launch Kickstarter campaigns, and people are raising hundreds of thousands of dollars on Kickstarter. Um, the, the, the misnomer with Kickstarter is it's not free money. It's essentially debt because you have a liability. If you sell widgets and you're doing a Kickstarter campaign and you're raising $500,000 so you can finish building your widget, then, oh crap, when I finish building my widget, I now have to ship 10,000 of them and I don't get any more money for those 10,000 that I'm shipping. So it's, so it's effectively like a venture debt, uh, but it is non-dilutive you know, from, from an equity perspective. And then again, the friends, family, and fools can be non-dilutive you know, if, uh, you know, if you have the right FF and Fs. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, or if not, or if not non-dilutive, they typically will accept whatever terms you give them, um, which is better than um, talking to the arm's length of those. Be careful if you do a Kickstarter campaign, because I, I did invest in a company at the point where um, customers were starting to get irritated because it took them months to fulfill on the orders, even after they figured out how to do it and manufacture it correctly. Um, so they're, you know, I, I still have confidence in them, but it, it's not, it's not trivial. It's, it's still, it's still a pretty difficult. But what Kickstarter does do, I think my whole thing about 10, 100, and 10,000, what Kickstarter does do is it solves two problems at once. A, it gets you some seed funding, and B, it demonstrates there's a market for your product. Yeah, because there's a whole that's bunch validated. of people who just prepaid you for vapor. Yeah. I mean, how, how much more of a validate? Now, now the, the next investor has to just know whether you can actually bring it from vapor to reality. And the investor has to be willing to cover the difference on all the money you're going to lose actually fulfilling those products. You're still selling the product at the product price. You still have R&D and all of your learning and execution all in there that you have to be able to support along the way. So that's, that's the thing to really keep in mind with Kickstarter is how much money can you afford to lose on each item you sell? Assuming you get to the point where, again, most of them are not successful and do not do that and it is a ton of work. I mean, that, that is a company in and of itself to be able to run a really good 
Kickstarter campaign. We just turned down a deal that raised a $700,000 raise on Kickstarter specifically because of that issue, because the liability of fulfilling those orders was too high a risk. Um, so this is not really my expertise. You know, I know there's Indiegogo, there's others that's more arts. So it's, I'm not. Uh, I've seen more deals on Kickstarter. It's, I mean, it's the same comment applies unless you're starting a GoFundMe page, which is basically donations, right? Uh, yeah. So let's talk about um, San Diego right now and what you guys are seeing in the marketplace. And, and if one of you could just give explanation for those who maybe don't know the difference between a company raising seed money and then Series A. There's nobody in this town who knows the answer to that, what the difference is. <laughs> but maybe, Andy, you're closest to it, so maybe you can give us a definition. <laughs> So historically, there were some numbers that you could use behind it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, and, and a big part of that is just that the bar is moving so fast. Um, I think Dean already covered kind of the, the angel group seed round, which is in that maybe 100,000 to a million. Um, that leaves a really big gap for early stage companies between zero and 100,000 that has pretty much all but gone away. And so when you look at that friends and family round, the, the historic definition of a true angel doesn't really exist in that form anymore, unless it is a friend or a family member, or a relationship that you've built, maybe a mentor or, or something like that. But it, the, the relationship piece of it is going to be crucial. Uh, and now it's, it's up to the entrepreneur to really understand how to bridge that gap. Um, the accelerator programs will do that. Uh, we don't have as many of those as we probably need in San Diego, at least if you look at the size of the community and the number of them that are out there. Uh, so it does. It, it leads to some challenges here right now just, just because of that piece. Uh, once you get beyond that, then, yeah, there's this weird stage of seed, but then you have seed plus and you have multiple seed rounds to then get to the point where you're going to raise an A, which then increases from there. Um, Basically, don't even you don't even have to worry about it until you get there. Yeah. Anyway. I don't think it matters. I, you know, I, I think I think of seri I think of seed as pre-institutional, and Series yeah. A is like VC or. Or, or I mean, there are accelerators, and I think you're closer to this than I am. But I just I was up in Santa Monica last week with Mucker Capital. They run Mucker Labs, which is a, an accelerator. I mean, they basically will put in a hundred grand, to take ten percent equity, so kind of a million dollar free money value for your for your um, company, and then just bombard you with a whole bunch of services and a whole bunch of support, which is the typical accelerator way. Um, but those accelerators are pretty competitive to get into. I mean, it's, you can't just like show up at their doorstep and they'll write you a check. They're, they're pretty. They're probably as hard to get into as raising an angel. Yeah. So based on what you're sharing, though, what's your best advice? For Nobody, nobody wants to give advice on this. Uh, so, 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 again, I keep quoting nameless people because I don't remember who said it, but somebody once said, um, if you want money, ask for advice, and if you want advice, ask for money. I said that. And did you say that? <laughs> yeah. That's good. So, so what I'm getting at is be out in the community talking to as many people as you can about your deal and ask them for help because lots of people like to give help. And then when they get inspired by what you're doing, if they have the means and if they're so disposed, they'll give money. If you show up to somebody's doorstep who doesn't know you're asking for money, you typically get advice on where you can raise the money from. Um, which is somewhere else. Yeah, which is somewhere else. Yeah, I, I would say um, network a lot and network early, um, very early on. I, you know, I had maybe a little bit of an inkling that I would end up with Delta Nutra Essentials, and it did turn out that way. But because I knew that, well, I'm a natural networker anyway, but um, because I knew that, I started networking a lot, you know, months and months and months. And it was for multiple reasons. One is because I was an angel investor, and I learned the most from other angel investors. So I was networking in that capacity anyway. Um, but now that I'm with Delta and Future Centrals and we're raising money, um, a lot of that networking has really you know, paid off. And so I. And, and a good example of how it paid off in real life is Amy brought her deal to TCA, and there were a few members who knew Amy from the networking she'd done in the community, and there were actually positive comments around, well, we don't know if this. 
product is going to work, but we know that Amy is going to protect our money. We know that Amy is going to do the right thing. We know, and that gets back to again the you know the jockey, not the horse. And so that goes a long way. It would be really good to have a good product too, uh, but it but it goes a long way if you can uh, build a personal brand that is based on trust and integrity and optimism, and humility and coachability and all the other things we talked about. Yeah, and we're, we're about 50% through the commitment that we need, and I can tell you that um, the, the money that we have already gotten in commitments, um, we have a third business partner who single-handedly went out and talked with his network and got those commitments, and so he didn't even go through an angel network, and, and he's a serial entrepreneur, so he's been doing that for a very long time, but um, you know, again, it was, it was all through networking, it wasn't even actually through so I can share personally, um, I've lived in the Bay Area during the Bay.com boom. I've lived in Los Angeles, and I'm born and raised in San Diego, came back here in 2009, and worked at a very uh, well-funded, I know there's no such thing as a well-funded startup, <laughs> but I can tell you that living in all three cities, that we are really, truly lucky to live in, in San Diego because it, it is a much easier climate to do business and to network. And when you show up in the community, it, people have a, a vested interest in helping each other succeed. And so it really is just half the battle is just showing up, right? Just showing up and getting out and meeting people and, and people getting to know you and vice versa. And their advice is brilliant. I mean, it really is just about asking for advice. And, but if you show up, you, you will make the relationship. And, it's, and it, I, I tell you, it is 100 times easier than Silicon Valley and so just, just showing up. So I commend you all for being here because this is definitely the start. I'll also add, I'll, this is a little bit of a plug, that um, on October 6th is the 10th anniversary of Tech Coast Angels Quick Pitch Competition, which is sort of like a shark tanky sort of thing where, you know, we have, I think we whittle it down to 10 uh, finalists who then give a two-minute pitch on what their business concept is. I want to say first place is $25,000. We've like significantly increased the, um, the prizes because it's a 10 year anniversary. And more important than the prize is the room is filled with actually angel investors, with VCs, with um, influential people in the community. So if you think you have a venture that's ready for seed funding and you're ready to tell your story in two minutes or less, um, um, if you go to Tech Coast Angels, I want to say techcoastangels.com will have the application here, if not Google, Quick pitch, you'll find it. Um, it's a great way to get into a really influential group of people who are looking to fund early stage deals. So let's talk about sectors. Um, I know San Diego, we have you know the biotech and all of that, but what sectors are really hot right now? And then on the other side of it, which one, are there any that are played out? Uh, pots are super hot. I don't understand them. I never invest in one, but that's what I hear around town. I think there's some cool stuff that's going to happen. What I'm Bots. AI. Yeah. Um, of course, Which in, is different than robots. Yeah. Those are pretty yeah. cool too, though. This is online robots. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, the, the sector piece of things, uh, so much of what's happening now is changing so quickly that it's, it's kind of tough to keep up and, and doesn't matter quite as much. Um, obviously, in San Diego, we have a very well-established biotech industry which you don't find in most areas so if you are doing something within that then there are uh, you know, very positive uh, resources available for you here and, and that's a plus. Uh, because of that it also causes some challenges for us because it skews a lot of our numbers. It doesn't take very many biotech event or biotech investments to make your community look like you have a ton of investment happening every year. We do but there's also a very small number of those that are taking up a majority of the money and it's not a community-wide sort of thing. So um, I totally changed the question, sorry about that. Uh, so that, that, that's the advantage here and, and definitely if you're in that space, that this is a great place to be and many other communities wish they had anything even close to what we have within biotech and chips and IP-based investment. Uh, on the software side, a lot of hot sectors, uh, we have bits and pieces of it, which is part of our challenge because we have so many bits and pieces. Um, gaming industry is hot right now, and we've got a lot of really great independent companies that are doing that. <laughs> I think we're going to start seeing, excuse me, some outside investment on that. Um, cybersecurity, a lot of that here, both from the 
IoT side and then also um, digital currency and, and the likes. Uh, very hot right now, a lot of that in San Diego. Not enough of it for us to be considered a hotbed for it or, or key, um, but some big players that are increasing their um, presence and can really make a difference in the industry. I think um, the investors are following along with that. I'm super excited about virtual reality and augmented reality, um, and it's going to affect us in ways we haven't even thought of. You know, whether it's whether it's riding my bike with glasses, whether it's a guy at a construction site who sees the blueprints while he's working on the job, whether it's the 50 plus people I saw in La Jolla Cove this weekend chasing down Pokemon. Um, I mean, that, there's it's going to impact us in a big way beyond just it's cool to put on goggles and watch a 3D experience. Um, so that's pretty exciting. San Diego doesn't have a big presence in that area. Um, the internet travel sector is super hot from an M&A perspective, so I'm actually investing in a, a, a company that um, is in that space because the exit is clear. There is the price lines and the, um, and the, the trip advisors and such a giant multi Expedia, giant multi-billion dollar companies that are uh, acquiring a lot of other companies. There are a lot of tired um, Facebook sort of wannabes, Facebook, Snapchat, like... Yeah, I don't like, want to see any more dating apps. Yeah. Yeah, the dating apps is a bit um, time. There's a lot Unless of... Unless it has Pokemon. <laughs> or, or, <laughs> that one's okay. Yeah. Or, or said a different way, the two-sided marketplaces are pretty hard to get past the hurdle of how are you going to build that two-sided marketplace. Um, uh, because the reality is everybody points to the big successes, but there's thousands of failures for every big success. And so uh, that's a good one. Yeah. And genetics, which is way above my pay grade. That's another in San Diego. It's a big all right, so let's talk about after the investment. So once an entrepreneur gets the check, typically what role do you guys play in those companies that you're a part of? So uh, when Techos Angel leads an investment round, we typically take a board seat in the company. Um, so we're, that usually means in the early stage of a venture, um, Participating in a formal board meeting once a month, which if all goes well turns into once every two months, which if all goes well turns into once a quarter. Uh, when I raised DCA money, I had a board of five, um, myself and my co-founder, um, a um, investment banker who was a friend of ours who helped us do some things early on, um, a Tech Coast Angels board member, and a mutually agreed um, outside director. And so those five, if you do the math, if I really screwed up, I could be fired because, you know, the three sort of non-founder people. Could, so it was the right balance where I felt comfortable with them, but if I didn't do my job, I could be fired. And that's kind of the way it should be because at the end of the day, you're an employee, your employee relationship in the company you founded is actually separate from your ownership or shareholder relationship. Uh, so, you know, I, I also take board observation rights quite frequently if we invest less money where... Um, I have the right to participate in your board meeting, even if I'm not a voting member, so I can kind of keep an eye on what's going on. Um, and then angel investors also expect um, quarterly updates. So send an email out to your investors once a quarter and let them know how things are going. Um, we hate only receiving communications when you need more money. Um, and there's amazing how many companies. When I was on the other side of the table, I sent out a very thoughtful email once a quarter so that seven quarters later when I needed money, people responded and, and they appreciated kind of the, the investor relations that I, I built. I've, I've helped some of my portfolio companies with investor relations because that's my background. So um, sometimes I help them with their investor communications. Um, sometimes when they're trying to close around, I help them to shepherd and, and kind of corral the other investors um, to get everybody you know, to close at the same time. And, and so those are some ways that, that I, I've helped out. Um, some of them, they just they just want to have coffee with me once a month to, to pick my brain. Um, some of them I'm on the board, um, and so they, they want a little bit more involvement. Uh, but you know, some of them, I mean, they know what they're doing, and they're making great progress. And so I just like everything they do on Facebook. Like anytime I see they post something in social media, I like it so that everybody in my in my social media sees it too. And so I just kind of give them free publicity. I'm sure my friends are like, why does Amy like this one right. company? Like, why does she like auto mechanics so much? <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm invested in a, uh, actually you're in a solar related yeah. company. And like, yeah, it's the same thing. You're like, what? what's this with you and solar? I was like, yeah. well, no, it's not for me. <laughs> but I like everything they do. Yeah. 
it's it's a challenging relationship. I think as an entrepreneur, it's it's very important to make sure you don't take money from anyone who you don't think you can be totally open and honest with. I mean, we just see it happen so many times where it's too little, too late, and if you love me, you give me more money. It's like, where was this conversation six months ago when we had a chance to actually do something about it? And it's hard. Um, you're talking with the person who gave you the money. You're also talking with the person who is your best access to more money. And so you want to put your best foot forward, um, but there's a difference between your best foot and not really being honest about what's going on. And that's, that's an important line that the entrepreneur has to be able to draw and have that conversation early. Uh, imagine what you would do once you were desperate and you only had two weeks worth of revenue or two weeks worth of payroll left. Because you'll get to that point and then you'll go back to your investors and they'll wonder why we hadn't talked about it earlier. And, and we know all the tricks. So, so like when you tell stories, we know it's bad. When you give numbers, we know it's good. There's like, there's, there's so, right. the, so yes, ultimately it is possible that you would lose your role in a company. That happens very rarely and very rarely with really early stage companies. Usually that's once you've had some success and there's something to salvage. Uh, and so, yeah. or there's a next chapter that needs a better, right, you know, right. like Which a more a lot of times you're in, 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 yeah, a lot of times you're a part of that conversation. Right. Um, so though, that, that's not the norm. And so we protect ourselves from these things that are the exceptions and it causes for bad relationships. So, be honest, um, I would start sending out updates immediately. When we're talking about building those relationships, that should be a list. When you meet with a mentor that you enjoyed the conversation with, ask them if you can put them on your update list and you send out an email once a month just keeping everyone abreast of what's going on with the company. It helps you stay on point for what you're doing. It helps you build that traction message and then keeps that communication going. Um, I have a team that in certain points, in their, in their cycles, they do weekly updates, which you would think were crazy, but it's not. They're very meaningful, they're very much so on point, they talk about the numbers, they talk about what they're gonna do, challenges that they've had and how they're going to address them, and nothing ever gets to the point where it's a super emergency, because you're aware as it happens. Now it's not that bad things don't happen, they do. We've got bad shipping and, and manufacturing problems and, and order issues, but everyone's aware of it as it's happening and the decisions, the good decisions that are being made along the way so you don't get to that point where here's all these six, or you know, this whole string of decisions that we made, each of which were worse than the one before and now we're in a really bad spot. So if you don't feel comfortable having that conversation, then don't take the money in the first place and then make sure if you do, you are open and honest because there's, there's so many more worse things that can happen if you're not. And, and if it does get to the point where you have ticked off all of your investors and they were good investors and you should have taken their money, then yeah, that's a time to kind of look at yourself and decide what you want to do with your, with your life next, which there's plenty of opportunities. Um, that's the great part of, of getting an investment is that in this country at least, it's not tied to you personally and, and you're going to have to dig yourself out of that forever. But just don't get yourself in that spot in the first place. Get, take investment from people you like and can trust and have those conversations early. And, and to Remy's point, it is a small town in San Diego, so when you do things that aren't great, that typically tends to follow you in this town. And, that's, and that applies on both sides of the table. Yeah, right. there, are, there are investors in town that nobody will take their money because of how they behave as investors as well. Yeah. And I, I can't stress enough the importance of finding the right investor. I know when we're looking for money and raising money, you know that you want to take whatever comes your way. And coming out of the, the startup that I had come out of,
Prevention Summit and our Para Labs and check that out. So let's go ahead and open it up for q and A. I know that I saw a couple hands go up. Um, yeah, so let's, we'll start right here and then we'll go to you next. If you want to stand up and introduce yourself or stand up. Right, my up. name is Andrew and I'm having questions about the, um, see, the startups majority is talking about the innovation, right? So now, when you guys as a VC or as the angels, what do you guys thought about startup who's in the early stage doesn't have any IP Not or patents? So how how yeah like what you guys thought about this? Well, they they do not have a provisional yeah. IP, but in the early stage, you guys can ask questions about how you guys how the startups can like protect themselves. Yeah. So so I, I I'll speak for kind of what I see at Tech Coast Angels. We don't necessarily expect software companies to have IP. Um, it's it's un, it, it's becoming harder and harder to enforce um, intellectual property protection on pure software plays. Um, so you know we, we do sometimes when somebody asks the question, well, what's your IP? You know people love to answer with, oh, I filed a provisional or this. Kind of, we get that the answer maybe is it's a you know it's a race, it's a first mover advantage, it's our team is a killer team that can't be replicated. I mean there are other things other than IP that can still. Give you a defensible competitive advantage. You know, this, uh, the CEO, CEO that in a pitch, say no, we don't have IP. Why do you guys feel like that? Um, we're fine with that as long as there's. A, I mean, if you're a life sciences play, you're probably booted out the door. Um, but if you're, uh, you know, the next Snapchat, we don't care. As long as you're a team that's going to build a community of a I'll billion like users. And, so what's that? How about the AI? AI is one of our so uh, this is this is not necessarily my area, but I'm a software guy. I wouldn't necessarily expect patent filing if you're a tool set or you know it's you know a pure software play. If, if it's robotics, if it's something else, then I probably would expect that you would go after it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would talk to somebody who's smarter in that area, and it's not hard to file a provisional, which at least lets you answer the question. I mean, you could file a provisional on LegalZoom. Um, you can, but, but it's not going to bring you anywhere. I mean, like any any solid fundamental. Like <laughs> what it's going to do, though, is it's going to it's going to set up time one. It's going to it's going to set the clock that now that IP is yours, subject to you filing the full patent. You're able to then explain to the investor that well, I didn't have the forty thousand dollars to file the patent, but I at least filed the provisional, and this is what we're thinking, and we can't wait for you to be on board so we can do the next step. And now you can actually have a dialogue about it instead of I got nothing. The company that I'm with, we, we have um, patents pending that have been filed internationally, and uh, we, we hope to finalize those. Um, but you know, truthfully, even if they get finalized, who really knows if you know it, it protects you adequately, right? Just because of the nature of patents. Um, so in some ways, this is completely an execution play. You know, we we 100% have to out-execute the competition. But at the same time, I also have some comfort knowing that at a minimum, no one can come after us and say that we didn't invent this product or that we don't have you know, a right to be selling it. Because at a minimum, it's documented out there in the public domain that this is our invention and we were the first to say it, right? And so, so you are more comfortable with the IP, even though it's operational, rather than no without an IP. I, I, it's better if you don't have to say no to an investor. So if you can say yes but, that's okay, probably better, no. or yes and, then, then that's, that's probably better. Bother. With that said, in due diligence, you're not going to con anybody. So in due diligence, if it's not patentable, if you don't really have IP, if there's prior art, that's going to be figured out. So you want to do the right thing. You have a question over here? Hi, my name is James Adams. I'm just wanting to introduce the panelists, invest in tech, life sciences, or both. I have never invested in a life science company and can't imagine that happening. So I'm mostly a software guy and I thought I had rules, but I've invested in a chewing gum company. I invested in the, the blindness genetics play. Um, and one of the cool things about being in an angel investment group is there are really, really smart people who are smarter than me who have different levels of expertise. And when the MD, PhD, who I really respect, digs the life sciences deal, it makes me more likely to do something I said I'd never do. So. Uh, my portfolio is super diverse. Um, and, you know, most things today, even if it's a process, it's going to be technology-based, right? So, so there's very few things that just require zero technology. Um, life sciences is a little bit more tricky um, because it's hard to understand and, and 
really, a, you know, and, and I totally don't understand the FDA approval process, right? So, um, so, but sometimes, you know, if, if I have friends that are also invested in something and they can explain it to me and why, you know, this is so compelling, I'll, I'll at least take a look at it. Uh, but, but it can be harder. to some degree you feel like it's a binary equation because you're so early that it's like this thing is either going to pay back something or not at all, right? So it's, it's kind of binary. So you're not, you're not thinking about like, well, is this going to return 10 times or 20 times? Because you're like, sometimes you're like, if it returns anything, that would be fantastic, right? So, so it's a little bit binary. I would say sometimes one strategy that angels have is if it's truly early stage, like they're not even sure how they're going to monetize this, um, one thing that angels might do is say, well, you're so risky because you don't even know how you're going to monetize that I really like your idea, I really like you, I trust you, I think you can figure it out, so I will make a much smaller investment, right? So I'll still have you in my portfolio, but it's going to be a small enough investment that, like, seriously, if you lose it, I don't care, right? And so so that's one, one thing that some angels might consider doing um, in that instance. There are some people who really just can't execute, even if it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, we, we've toyed with, at Tech House Angels, we're looking at doing what we call a seed track, which is um, $100,000 in 14 days at a million dollar free money value. So everything's pre-negotiated, pre-done, no, no negotiating the term sheet, but you get $100,000. You give up, kind of like the Mucker Capital example, you give up 10% equity. Uh, we haven't fully engaged on that yet. We have to make sure we have members who are willing we need 10 members to write a $10,000 check or five members to write it in order to make that work. Um, the best way to do it, again, is to um, interact in the community and find somebody who's been in the industry that you're trying to attack and inspire them. Because if you find, like, let's say you're in the hotel industry and you find somebody who's made it big in the hotel industry and he just loves what you're doing and he just wants to be a part of it, um, he or she can make a you know, meaningful investment, you know, even if it's 50 grand or 20 grand, take a little piece. And that's as much emotional investment as it is financial investment. I would say the accelerator programs have pretty much set the standard for that. So if you're getting terms outside of it, then the investor doesn't believe in you enough to really believe in what you're doing. Um, it's the wrong investor. Uh, if, if that's the way the relationship continues, it can get to the point where it sucks the incentive out of it for the entrepreneur, and it just goes right back to the right money. So. If you're not within that window of what you could get out of an accelerator program. And, and is your experience like 10% for undergrad? Yeah, is that yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, just for an idea, no execution on that. For someone to come to you and give you money and say, I think your idea that you've not executed on is worth a million dollars, that's pretty impressive. Right. Uh, and I don't even know that it, that, that's, that's a, that's, you've done enough to be able to get into an accelerator program, so there might be less of that. But for someone to say, I'll give you $100,000 and I want 50% of the company, then where do you go from there? Even if you are successful, it's just, it makes it really hard on the entrepreneur to, to stay engaged in what's happening. And we have a lot of damage control at TCA where we're now providing the first sort of arm's length investment and we're dealing with the uncles or the aunts or the bad deals that happened before that we now have to unwind because we won't invest based on that. We don't want you to be disincentivized. And if with our investment round, you're now diluted to 20% ownership in your company and you've just still at the starting line, that's not going to work either. Great.
keeping the idea, afraid to put it out there, afraid of infringement, or copying them. What do you think about that? Should they, should they share it openly? Should they go to investors? Should they go to networking events? What do you think about that? Well, here's the irony with that. Once you have your product out there, there's nothing you can do to tell enough people about it. So if you're afraid that right now that this is such an easy thing to do that if you tell the very next person sitting next to you and they'll be able to go execute on it, then it's probably not going to be very defensible anyway. So my view is you should share as much as you can. There are certain situations in blue ocean research where maybe you wouldn't, but if this is something where you're solving someone's problem in a unique way, at least talk to your customers and define how big that problem is. You don't necessarily have to talk to other entrepreneurs, but it's also a, a sign that you've, you've got an issue with your company or your product in that you're afraid that it'd be so easy to replicate. And, and, and no investor will sign a non-disclosure. There's only 500 deals a year. And if I had to sign an NDA for every one of them, I literally wouldn't know who to talk to ever when I got out of bed because I made so many commitments to so many people that I couldn't talk. One thing to remember is if you've got an idea that's truly disruptive, um, you probably don't need to worry about the incumbent leader in that industry, you know, actually go, even though they have millions and millions of dollars and could possibly go and like replicate your idea, the reason why they probably won't is because your idea is so disruptive that it would actually cannibalize what they're doing first. Um, and most of them are just very uncomfortable with that, right? So they almost would like to pretend that it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. They don't acknowledge that it's happening until it's actually happening and that disruptor is being successful in a very significant way. And by then, you've already gained traction, right? But that is literally the psychology of a corporate incumbent industry leader. And remember, I get 10, prototype 100, customer 10,000. So the further you can go on that continuum, the less you'll have to worry about, right? And the investor's yeah. not going to say, oh, I'm now going to go do, like, um, concussion management in yeah, high schools or whatever. Yeah, because I don't know about that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. but also, um, the other thing is, if the incumbent knows about your disruption now because you've gained traction, they actually might want to buy you. And so you actually do kind of want to be on their radar. All right. We'll take two more questions, and then we'll have some time for networking. So we'll go here and okay. My name is Charles. So I want to ask you guys a quick question. Um, an entrepreneur I have an idea. I come to you guys, any one of you guys, and say, hey, I have this idea, but I don't want to fund it right now. I want to get you on my team as an advisor for the next couple of weeks or months to help me see if it's a very good idea since you have experience in that sector. Is this something you guys would be willing to do? So that's, I think that gets back to the asking for advice first or asking for help first and, and money later. I, I have a lot of meetings every week with entrepreneurs who are very, very early stage. So um, it never hurts to ask. Right? Yeah, I probably network with at least three founders a week. But that's, that all goes back to building relationships. You don't, don't go into that with your first ask, uh, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Just build the relationship. Yeah, have that first meeting, have the coffee, see if there's a rapport, if you even right. like what the other person's saying, and then can have a next meeting, and if they're impossible to get a hold of and they don't return your calls, then you know it's probably not, not the one. Right. Hi, my name is Bill. Um, first of all, thank you for your advice. We really, all right, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm in the first bucket of no revenue, but we have DARPA funding. Um, Did you say DARPA funding? DARPA, yeah, okay. you know, SPIR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. How would you present? How do you look at that? Well, we don't have revenue. Need additional funding to get the product, you know, commercialized. So we have yeah. received some SDR in our funding. So to be clear, almost no life sciences deal has revenue, and they all get funded. So it's, yeah. it's possible. It's um, if, if, if you, no, I know, but if, if if you know, again, it's it's the whole package, right? If you're doing really important work that's defensible, no pun intended with the DARPA that's protected, that um, is, has a huge market, then it's just, yeah, it'd be great if you already had a product and were shipping, but it's not mutually exclusive. It's, it's, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards and you know, we could figure the, out. You know. the, the key to that is what have you done with the money that you've received? 
Yeah. If that's we were at stage one, we received this money, and now we're at stage 1.1. That's not a very impressive story. If it's now we've gotten to this point and we're ready for X, then and you can tell that story and you have that traction, then that's a much much different scenario. And and, and uh, sophisticated investors love non-dilutive funding. So if you have you know meaningful non-dilutive funding, that's good too. I just, I just want to add that a lot of the questions that are coming out, a lot of you guys are great. <laughs> you know, because we are going to help you along with these guys to take your company to the next level, whatever take you that to the next level. Take you and your company to the next level, whatever that might be. So, yeah, take, take a look at the accelerator. Yeah. So, on that note, we want to thank you all for coming. And again, thank you, Bree, for being here today and sharing your time.